you know, just like physical illness, mental illness can be overcome. We just got to inspire people to believe that. The mental health community and the firearms industry have spent way too much time running parallel to each other without communicating. It's time we change the narrative and destroy the stigma that we both face. Walk the Talk America presents Guns and Mental Health, a podcast for firearms owners, clinicians, and the curious public. All right, listening audience, welcome back. This is another WTTA pop-up podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Today, I am joined again by my co-host, Kevin Berry. How are you, sir? Doing good. Long time no see. Long time no see. <laughs> we got four podcasts now in the next couple of days like under our belt. So, uh, But these are always fun. I enjoy these. And our guest today is somebody who means a lot to me, uh, somebody I think is super important in the firearms community for the firearms community. As a matter of fact, sir, when I met you, I thought you were a breath of fresh air. Uh, you are a 2A advocate, a firearms instructor. Uh, you run Aiming for the Truth and No Other Choice Training. I mean, what more can we say about you? Kevin Dixie, how are you, sir? I'm good, Mike. I appreciate the kind intro, man. Um, you were a breath of fresh air as well from um, a lot of individuals I met on a professional level. Uh, glad to see that it turned personal real quick. But I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate the kind intro. and. Uh, I'm ready to see if we can talk to the audience about what we do. Yeah. The reason why I wanted to have this pop-up uh, podcast is I wanted to talk about something that a program that's near and dear to my heart that was started by uh, Devin Perkins called kids to Kings. It's something that walk mm -hmm. the talk America. It means a lot to us. Um, but what I wanted to do, cause I feel like everyone's always hearing about kids to Kings from Devin or, you know, obviously me and Kevin, Barry and Jake and things like that. But you're one of the instructors that is really like boots on the ground, hands on with these kids. So I kind of wanted to get your perspective of why this program is important, what you've seen, like walk us through it, because I don't think the video clips we see on social media do it the justice that it deserves. Yeah, you know, I, I will say this. I have been doing community outreach since I can remember. I've been doing it for a long time. It's, it's something that I'm, I've always been passionate about. And I wouldn't say anything Devin hasn't already said publicly and open. When I, when I started aiming for the truth, uh, he looked at that program and was like, you know what, I would like to do something similarly. So he watched, he assisted, he asked questions for several years. And he said, hey, you know, what do you think about this particular spin that I would like to put on things? I was a thousand percent for it, right? Thousand percent for it because he's a young man who is closer to the age of the young men that are experiencing the life struggles that they are experiencing. So I thought it was really, really uh, impactful that he wanted to put his imprint from what he's learned on the lives of young men and help them go from kids to a king mindset, which is respect. Uh, you know, being a pillar in your community, having a good moral compass, emotional intelligence, raising families, uh, kind of denouncing violence, if you will, and all those things. So I was on board for it and, and have been a big supporter of it. And so when you guys approached me about being the, the lead firearms instructor for the kids, to me, it was a it was an honor. It was a compliment. Right. Because I can still do what I love to do as far as community outreach without um, without sacrificing let's just say profitable time for something that still doesn't return good equity. And these children return great equity. So to be out there for them is absolutely phenomenal and have the trust of uh, Devin and the rest of the team is, is absolutely great. And I think what people are missing is although we are shooting guns. So if you are pro 2A, if you are pro, we want kids to have proper firearms education. If you just like to see young people shooting guns, congratulations. We meet every ounce of that that you can imagine, right? Every single ounce of it. Uh, and they aren't just out, you know, and nothing wrong with grandpa, nothing wrong with going out in the backyard shooting the, the tin cans with grandpa. There's nothing wrong with that story. Uh, but these kids are being educated from a pretty high level, right? They're, they're being educated about everything widget and wadget when it comes to the firearm. That is fantastic. That is great. They understand proper terminology. They have the nomenclature. They have those things. They understand breath control, stance, how to grip a firearm, isometric pressure, um, uh, you know, um, 
focus picture, flash picture, all the, the nuance and science that we can go into, the kids are getting, right? They're learning now how to pivot their hips, why they have to stand a certain way, um, how to mitigate recoil of a firearm, what a red dot is, what iron sights are, why guns are designed and engineered the way that they are. They, they're getting all that. But I think the thing that goes missed is the fact that they're actually being taught one of the safety rules that I've introduced, and that's proper attitude, right? Who are we when it comes to the gun? A lot of people fail to realize that when we talk about violence, uh, I don't like to call it gun violence, when we talk about violence uh, in America, especially in urban settings, but not not isolated to urban settings, but let's let's face it, we focus on the urban setting, just like when it's a school shooter, we focus on suburban kids, right? We focus on an urban setting and there people are looking over the fact that these kids are actually being taught how to deal with not only their mental health, but their emotional intelligence. And the argument I give to that is we've said in America ever since uh, GWAT, the global war on terror, we've said that, hey, we send these young men and women to these unfortunate circumstances filled with this unfortunate violence. And they might not even make it four years, you know, right? a, a average contract. And they're home and a PTSD, the suicide rates among veterans and all these things. And then we will make news references to how Chicago is so bad because we've lost more people in the streets of Chicago than we did in a war. Right. So if the people in the war can come back with PTSD from what they've been seeing for a few years, what the heck is happening to these kids that's in it all their lives? Right. So what are they dealing with? Uh, how are they being taught to reconcile? And so people are missing the fact that we are actually instituting those kind of programs with the children. They're never just coming out shooting a gun. I have mandated and you, you're dang all right. I mandated that they will come shoot guns for a half or three fourths of the day. But we also have to do something else in the day, um, it, whether it's going over emotional intelligence and what that means, not just saying, hey, guys, be intelligent with your emotions, giving the kids space to say, I don't feel safe. I don't feel seen. I don't feel heard. And, and how can we reinforce the fact that they are valued, right? Because if a child can't get you to listen to them, then it's a good chance, just like any grown adult, if they can't get you to listen, they have a desire to want to be valued and you're not paying attention to them, you're not valuing their words, then they're going to resort to other means to get you to pay attention. But either way, you are going to pay attention to me, right? So we want to make sure that they're seen, they're heard, they have a place to voice how they feel, what struggles they're going through. When we ask these kids on the onset, hey guys, you know, what violent acts have you seen committed with firearms? We heard everything from drive-by shootings to I watched my dad get shot in front of my face and everything in between, right? We've had children that are, uh, that are associated with the program or connected with kids in there. I mean, we, I've lost, I know, Two kids that we were trying to get knee deep in this program, we lost them to legit gang violence that made local television where two of them lost their lives. One of them was killed and one of them is going to juvenile and then uh, prison for the rest of his life. Didn't really get a chance to like incorporate them into the program. But the kids that have been incorporated to the program, they aren't resorting to those things because they're also with individuals that can tell them, I know what the streets are like. I know the impulsive nature of the streets, which is why we want you to be able to control your emotions. Right. But why are they controlling their emotions where we have to take them, allowing them to vent and allowing them to know that their value is exceeded beyond whatever the streets is telling them. So not only do we have to attack their own mindset, their own mentality, we also have to help them address what they're dealing with all their life, what their environment is bringing to them, what their parents might be missing, what's happening at school. So we aren't just teaching kids how to shoot. We're teaching young men how to be more educated, not only with the firearm, but how to be more educated about what they're going through, what they're experiencing, how they can avoid being another just stat in their environment, in their neighborhood. So I would say that's the thing that goes most missed. People don't they don't want to acknowledge the fact that, yes, we can teach kids how to shoot guns. But what does it do for me to teach you how to operate a machine properly? But something is really wrong up here or in here and you've never got a chance to address it. That doesn't help anybody, nobody at all. So we want to make sure that we're dealing with their mental health, we're, we're getting them the emotional intelligence they need, and we're showing them that they have love and support. And now on top of that, you know, when the kids come out uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, intro to financial literacy class put on for them by a Ph.D. in numbers. Right. All the fancy stuff with the numbers. We had someone come out and dedicate their time to talk to the kids about 
you know, money. What is money and what does money look like? And why is that important? Because look at the reasons that a lot of young adults or even adults, period, are committing some of the things they're committing. A lot of it is revolved around finances. If people lose everything that they have financially, mental health is right at risk, right? So we're teaching them about numbers and money so they understand that from an early age. So they know, oh, I'm shooting. Oh, these guys are really helping me out with being heard, being seen, any kind of mental struggles or emotional struggles I might have, but I'm also learning skills. So I'm learning how to read and write and comprehend things better outside of the classroom. I'm learning about money. Uh, last week, they got a chance to Cerakote guns. That was the soft skill for the day. They got a chance to learn how to, well, not Cerakote, um, rattle can, rattle can firearms. Uh, they're learning uh, about law careers. We have a lawyer that's going to come in and talk to them about, hey, I'm an attorney and this is what that pathway looks like and all these other things. Right. And then they're going to also be introduced to Bushwick craft. Right. How do you start a fire? How do you camp? How do you pitch all those things? Because Greenwood, the facility where they're at, is able to foster all of those things. They're also learning how to live off the grid. One of the donations that uh, Walk the Talk made via Kids to Kings was for uh, off the grid restroom. Right. And we're able to show them how that is put in, how you can live off the grid, what solar panel is. Right. And so uh, a couple of weeks, they're going to really learn how to build a solar grid for themselves. So they're learning independence and they're you're starting to see their value increase. And then on top of that, they're having a good time. I cannot tell you how many times as adults think I'm this intimidating figure. Right. People are always like you got a bad case of RBF. You're mean looking. Nobody really wants to engage with you. And then you take these eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds, and they get out the car and they haven't taken a breath yet and they're talking smack, right? They're having a good time because you can tell they're comfortable. They're comfortable. They're around structure, but they know that they're loved. They know that I don't have to show up here and be the tough kid that's ready to fight every time somebody says something because I can get out, talk smack like any 10 year old would, poke fun at Mr. KD, have a good time. But I know if he touches me and touches me on the top of my head and say, hey, listen, I know that there is some discipline in the room. I know that I need to pay attention, Uh, but I'm also loved. So I'm not just being yelled at. I'm not just being disciplined. I'm being loved at the same time. So I think all those things, sorry for the long winded answer, but all those things are the the meat and potatoes of what we do and people are missing it. And then what that means for the Second Amendment is that we are putting better educated human beings, these little bitty human beings that we are bringing up to show value. And then they understand what the gun and how the gun plays a part of that. Right. But it is no longer their problem solver. It is no longer what they run to to say, this is how I'm going to fix my issues, because they they're being taught that that is not how we fix issues. It is not how we fix these issues at all. A gun. And like I told them in the the last talk we had about the, the school shooting close to here, that is the exact opposite of what we want out of you. We don't pick up guns to solve our problems. You're not even. You're not even wise enough yet to understand self-defense and things of that nature. Right. We don't we don't even go over that stuff with those kids yet. Um, so that's what I, I wish people would see more is that if you're really trying to make a difference and you really want the Second Amendment overall to be protected. Well, let's stop giving people that want to snatch your freedoms more stat lines via these children. Let's build these ki- kids up with good skill sets, good human traits that are also understanding the responsibility of firearms. Because remember, a lot of these kids are going to be able to vote in six years. So they'll be able to say, hey, no, absolutely. Guns are not the problem because I learned about emotional intelligence when I was 10 years old in in this after school program. I learned about how to control myself. So the gun isn't the problem because I haven't hurt anybody. So now the Second Amendment gets these advocates that are able to say, no, not only was I introduced to the gun, I was introduced how to be a better person and how to be a healthy person, how to make wise decisions. So that's what I wish people would see more of. For almost 75 years, Strum, Ruger & Company Incorporated has been a model of corporate and community responsibility. Their motto, Arms Makers for Responsible Citizens, echoes their commitment to these principles as they work hard to deliver quality and innovative firearms. They offer consumers almost 800 variations of more than 40 product lines across both the Ruger and Marlin brands. And since 2021, Ruger has been a strong supporter of Walk the Talk America in full alignment with this mission and philosophy. We invite you to check out Ruger.com and browse their multiple products and help support our mission along the way. Walk the Talk America thanks Ruger for its continued support of this show and our mission. Yeah, it's really interesting you say that because we just had uh, Katie Gardner on our last pop-up 
podcast and we were talking about the political thing, right? Cause she has a, a all woman's event that she throws annually and it's all walks of life, right? Cause she's out of Michigan and basically everybody comes there. So you got Republicans, you got Democrats, you got people that are just interested women who are interested in the second amendment and the firearms because they see the importance of it. And we, we were talking about, I think where, the industry and the community has failed, especially when it comes to like the liberal side of things, right? Because we can all agree that most pro-gun people usually are center right. And most of the anti-gun people you see you go center left. And I think it's an easier battle for us to win, not to try to change, not that that I, I'm in the middle. So, but not to, you know, you always hear these gun people saying, well, that they're, the way they vote, if they would just vote Republican, things would be fine. But it's like not everybody wants to vote Republican. But they, I think we have a much easier battle if we make people understand that the Second Amendment is not an issue. And you have liberals talking to liberals, creating force multipliers out there, taking the meetings with the politicians, saying, no, this is an issue that needs to be thrown out of, of what you're saying. and. I think you're just, you know, it's a pipe dream to like say, oh, we're going to teach all these kids to shoot. And then all of a sudden they're going to have all this other political belief. No, you got to you got to attack the main issue. The issue is Second Amendment rights and it shouldn't be political. Everybody should be entitled to it. And I think that when you go into areas where you say, OK, they're they're you know, it's probably more left leaning areas where you and I grew up, Kevin, mm-hmm. like, let's face it. Right. Um, and I've heard you say it in the past, like, you know, to think that we're not surrounded by that, or we're not leaving our neighborhoods. We're not, we're not abandoning the people we grew up with. That's never going to happen. So we have to play with other people's ideas when it comes to the second amendment in a nice manner. Um, but I think that this is a way to do it. I think this is, you have these young kids that have never been introduced because the elephant in the room is when it's little white hunters, Nobody bats an eye. It's like, oh, little George is out there, you know, in his camouflage with a rifle. Like, that's not a problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And and I don't know. What, let me ask you that. How, how, did, how is that not so obvious? Like, how is that not so obvious to people that, that firearm safety and this type of uh, mentorship is not just for little white hunters? Uh, because as much as people complain and will say pro 2A, people will go, well, the Second Amendment is for everybody until it hits your bias, right? Because the, the little white hunter being taught by the stereotypical gun-owning white dad shows their family values, right? It shows a potential of, hey, you know, we, we get together, we hunt, you know, we eat, we, we live off the land. And it has all these different signals that it sends out to the brain that confirms your bias, confirms that guns aren't bad. Guns are great. You know, uh, your family or my 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 neighbor's family, they haven't hurt anybody. They're just good people. They go out, they work hard, um, they they don't ask for handouts, and it starts feeding all these little things. And then when you start thinking about people that might live in a different area from you, sometimes just 45 minutes away, and it's like, oh, well, they're lazy, and they're all dangerous. And when you see one of their offspring with a gun, it triggers the bias that you have towards them. Which is why Second Amendment people have said, oh, so you guys are teaching gangbangers how to shoot better. Never seen a picture of the kid. Never seen a kid holding a gun. Didn't, haven't seen anything. And you're talking to somebody that more than likely knows more about guns than you do. So it's not like I represent that image. Right. So where are you getting that from? That is your perceived bias, which is why they're having such a hard time wrapping their heads around it. But then the cognitive dissonance will come in and say, but the Second Amendment is for everybody. No, it's for everybody that you approve. It's for everybody that you think should have it. And then you will scream about total freedom. It's not really total freedom because in your brain, certain people don't need guns, which is why certain certain times will be like, oh, uh, we see Timmy get his rights violated via the Fourth Amendment. Right. And people go, well, that's messed up and let a gun be involved. And it's it's a violation of his Fourth Amendment. He has a Second Amendment right and all these things. But then something happens to, you know, little Derek uh, in the hood where he's a victim of some sort of stop and frisk. And then it's like, well, they got to get they got to get guns away from those uh, dangerous thugs anyway. Really? Really? Well, he doesn't have a Fourth Amendment right. That's a violation of that. He doesn't have a Second Amendment right. 
right? And how you know that he's not the one that unfortunately, because of economics, can't move out of the area, even if he wanted to. And he just has a gun because he has firsthand knowledge of how rough his surroundings can be. Right. So I believe that that uh, the bias starts to really plague people. And that's why they can't see beyond their own ignorance. Yeah, it's it's definitely a shame. And it's it's crazy because I I speak at a lot of events that I'm told what, before I get to the event that this crowd's very anti-gun and it never scares me at all. As a matter of fact, I almost get comfortable when I hear that because I get excited because I'm like, okay, I get to go in there and watch. I'm going to turn this whole room out and they're going to see people's head nodding. And I know I'm going to get all the people after going, I never even thought about that or I love what you do and I think it's really cool. And when I talk to them about Kids of Kings, um, it's only gotten a positive response. And and I will say this, besides the stupid comments online that you see every once in a while from idiots, like for the most part, when I when I can sit somebody down from the firearms industry and talk about kids at Kings, they have that same response. So we we've hit on something that has that gets the same type of reaction from crowds, whether you're on the far left or the far right. Um, and I think somehow we just got to bring it to sort of this next level to get people to see how important it is to lean into this, uh, because there's nothing more important for uh, Kevin Barry, you've heard me tell all these goofy little stories about just like the reason why I don't smoke cigarettes, right? Like is because I had a mentor that when the first time I was trying to show off in front of him, and I lit up a cigarette in front of him. He was like, man, we don't do that. Where you, do, you know, that's stupid, right? That, that, that changed the direction. Cause I was like, Oh, he's not down for cigarettes. And I threw the cigarette out, right? Never smoked a cigarette again. Um, you know, I think about all the times that someone empowered me by believing in me uh, for whatever it would be. Even, you know, you think about it, like you with these young men handing them a firearm and saying, I believe that you're capable of, of mastering this. I believe that you could be a competition shooter. I believe that you could be a firearms instructor like me. I believe that you could teach other people from our neighborhood about the importance of the Second Amendment. And those kids are taking that information in. And I don't care if they never tell you, then they go home, you know, they feel good about it. And especially as someone who came from a broken home, I was raised by a single mother. Like I didn't have a father. Um, many of these kids have are in the same situation I was, but they're worse off because they're in much worse neighborhoods than I grew up in. Right. Like I know the importance of, of what you can provide to these kids, what Devin provides to these kids. And the tough love with the combination of the like, let's keep you on the right path, but also let's teach you skills that you may need in the future that they're going to ignore in school. Um, I mean, I think this is this is much better than the scenario of the little white hunter, right? <laughs> you don't know what's like they're not hitting all these marks. We're hitting all these marks. And you, you put it in an Instagram post. It was like a reel one day when you're like, take the gun aspect out of this. What we're providing to these kids is invaluable. Like you just, you can't get it and it's free. Like, that's the thing is like, we're, we're out there hustling and, and just like pulling every penny together to make it free to these kids. And, you know, I think about all this money that we give to, to other places, Ukraine, all this crap. And it's just like, we're pulling this off of very little. Imagine what we have, if we had some money to really put behind it. Um, right. Many, many of these kids need transportation. You know what I mean? Like we can go get them. Um, we can bring them to these areas. And like I said, the stuff that you're doing is just, I can't thank you enough. Uh, and I just think it's awesome. And I guess to take the second amendment piece out of it, even though it's a huge part, because I, I really feel like the firearms industry needs to do more things to bring people together, as opposed to either you believe in it or you don't second amendment prior from a cold dead hands. I think like the more that we can come forward and people always say this, why do you care what they think? I don't care what they think. It's the right thing to do but I do care what they think. You know what I mean? Cause I want to win and, and I want people to understand that this is the way to do it. It's not taking something away from somebody or saying you're not good enough or only I can help you because you're not smart enough to help yourself or you don't have the resources. Like I hate that shit. So I don't know. Like it's just something that, like I said, we need, we need, we need to really, we need people to focus in on this and see how beautiful this program is. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I think that the Second Amendment has always asked, and rightfully so, the Second Amendment community has been asking for a long time, like, 
what else can we do? Sometimes they're they're presenting it to, you know, what I like to call anti-freedom people. They're presenting it to them like, what else can we do, right, to prove to you that we're not the problem, right? We've shown you the stats. We've went through this. What else can we do? Well, um, you can start doing things that it's hard to argue against. Nobody with a good mind can look at you assisting children and get mad. Okay. All right. Who's going to argue with the fact that you know, I don't care now this, I don't care what neighborhood you go to. How many times do we, um, you know, look at the local news and see that young person has gotten their hands on gun and they accidentally, you know, shoot someone else, right? Shoot a, a, a sibling, a family member, mom or dad. Uh, I mean, heck we've had a, it was like a two-year-old that was uh, rambling in mom's purse a few years back and hooked the trigger and, and shot a mom in the grocery store line. So if we're teaching children how to be safe, how do you argue with that? If we're teaching them how to control their emotions so they're not using guns in a negative light, how do you argue with that? If your Second Amendment and these kids are learning how to be more self-dependent and they're learning how to control their emotions and they're understanding things about the nomenclature of the gun and all things 2A, how do you argue with that? So you put people in a position, to your point, where they, they can't argue. The Second Amendment community, though, needs to be a little bit better at realizing that what you are asking for is in front of you. Will you back it or are you going to hide behind your bias or your laziness? And what I mean by that is I said this years and years ago. Um, I'm gun control's worst nightmare because I'm the inconvenient black truth. And I absolutely mean that. Right? I don't get in, in as many anti-gun debates as people would think. I don't, because normally when I talk, people are like, yep, not going to lose that one. Because they're like, how do I argue that? Right. How, what do you really say back against that? So when it comes to helping out the same kids that were in the position I was in, I know firsthand that if you want to have somebody with a different voice and have somebody with a different angle and have somebody with a different live life experience that can help you, these kids are the way. Plus, you get to help them because think about it. If you are from rural Pennsylvania and you're yelling at someone who has control or lives in an urban environment about guns, right? Yeah, they should be pro-gun. They should be this. They should be that. And you're trying to get them to change their mind. You don't necessarily speak the same language as them. No differently than when somebody's saying 1776. Well, depending on who you're talking to, uh, we tell people, know your history, understand, read and research. Well, cool, man. Well, in 1776, uh, black people weren't free. So why would I tie into the freedom of the rest of America when I wasn't free. You don't understand how to communicate with the person you're trying to reach. There's a different way of trying to reach them, things they will more likely latch on to. So who's going to be better at that? Somebody from rural Pennsylvania or a kid who grew up in the midst of everything, but also has had a better education about not only themselves, but about the gun and has been shooting for a while. They're going to be able to take their environmental exposure, their expertise in their environment, Plus what they've been coupled with when it comes to responsible gun ownership and kick your butt up and down the street every day of the week like those. So if you want to win, you don't you got to I don't mean it as a Trojan horse in a negative light, but you definitely need to put advocates inside of the problem. For they can fix it from the inside out right now, what you're doing is just throwing things because it sounds good. It sounds good to say Mona Lab. It sounds good to say cold dead hands. All those things sound great. You're not winning anything with that, though. You're, you're it's it's. You're, what are you winning? What are you, you're not changing anything with that. Although if you yell Mona Lab, I'm in agreement with you. If you yell cold dead hands, I'm in agreement agreements with your point. However, what is that doing to change the political structure? What is that doing to change the lives of people? How are we assisting? So I, I believe that if the Second Amendment community or the freedom community really wants to win, you also have to acknowledge that you've been doing the same thing for four or five decades now and it has not worked. It has not worked. And you should absolutely take advantage of the fact that you have professionals that are willing to educate you on ways that are different, that help human beings, that help your fellow American, first of all, helps them. And then at the same time, will help your point about maintaining and expanding freedom, because I really don't think people understand the kind of expertise that exists in Walk the Talk and Kids to Kings. I really think people you once said before, um, people arguing with me about selling guns. I probably sold more guns than anybody else in this country. Right. Like that is a level of professional expertise that exists, right? Professional firearms trainers, expertise, 
uh, professional counselors, expertise, people from the environments, expertise. There's a lot of expertise and they align with your mission. Second Amendment community, they align with your mission about expanding freedom, not more laws, not all these you know, red flags. We want to get rid of all of that. We don't even want to have the conversation. So if we're willing to tell you and show you that this is the light, this is the way, this is the change that you've been screaming and yelling for, why not support it? Why not donate? Why not get involved? And then let us show you, right? But you have to be willing to take the chance and um, you know, the risk of getting out there and saying, yeah, I'm going to back this because this is different. And second of all, this might seem like something that people don't think is important, but let me tell you, it kind of is. Because you know one thing about when the Second Amendment community jumps in and helps a mission that has alignment to the urban demographic, immediately they defeat the gun owner's racist stereotype. Right off the bat. Mm -hmm. That no longer becomes a part of that conversation. Because people can't say, oh, what are you going to say? Oh, the white people gave you money to better educate our kids and keep them out of prison. That's racist. Right? So That's it's like, right. well, now can I argue and tell you that you are now stereotyping people that actually want to help your children, that actually do want to help your community, and they provided the means via this way, and I'm just here to make sure that those means reach your home and make your home better. So are you sure that these gun owner white guys are really racist or are they really about freedom? And maybe you've been talking to them through a political uh, filter and it's reached your ears in a negative way. Right. So allow me to be the conduit and show you that these Americans actually do care about you and your family and proper gun ownership and your children. And this is what they've donated. This is what they've helped provide for you to have that exposure. So I think that it's, it's so many different angles we can we can look at where this program is absolutely the answer. Now, it's never going to take off if it has to stay, you know, on its own, if people aren't willing to give. Because when we look at the amount of money, and I want to be very, very clear about this, what I'm about to say, I am not saying we shouldn't be donating and giving to other causes involved in law enforcement and military, uh, active military and military veterans. I am not saying that at all. Matter of fact, whatever you give, see if you can give a little bit more. But when it comes to programs like this, we have to understand something. You, if you, if we can raise as a industry millions and millions of millions of dollars for these givebacks to these individuals that do deserve it, then how come we can't raise any money to help out the children, which we will all argue are the future of our country? And on top of that, Second Amendment community, from a business standpoint, uh, we've all been touting these numbers of black women being the largest uh, gun buying demographic for the last three to five years, give or take, depends on who you talk to. Uh, so they're the largest. Gun buying demographic. One of the argument points about leftists is the fact that, you know, they just come into our communities to steal the province of our resources, leave, never do anything for us. Well, OK, I will then add to that. Well, the Second Amendment industry, if they're the largest gun buying demographic, that means the gun store is benefiting. The gun manufacturer is benefiting. The accessory companies are benefiting. The range is benefiting. Right. Because the ammo companies are benefiting. The holster companies are benefiting. Case companies are benefiting. Air Pro, I Pro. Uh, so, you know, cleaning supplies, all these products and manufacturers are benefiting from the largest gun buying demographic in America for half a decade running. And you won't give a red cent back to help the kids of those exact women. So it seems like to me you're taking a leftist tactic, too. We'll exploit, we'll extract, but we won't give back. Mm -hmm. So. There's that. Jake, it's time to spotlight one of my favorite organizations in the firearms industry, the National Association of Sporting Good Wholesalers. Yeah, let's do it. Not only was I a customer when I owned Eagle Imports for many years, but they're also a sponsor of Walk the Talk America and our mission. The NASGW is comprised of wholesalers, manufacturers, independent sales reps, media, and service providers, both national and international, all whom have a primary focus on shooting sports equipment and accessories. As a trade association representing the business interests of its members, NASCW's mission is to bring shooting sports buyers and sellers together. For more information about the NASGW, visit the association's website at nasgw.org. That was a good read, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Ke uh, Kevin Barry, as an outsider, someone who's fairly new to this, right? Like, You made a good point in the chat, right? You said... One of the statistics, go ahead, you say it, because you said, you know, you said it, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. I mean, 
talk, posting on social media, people will push back on, oh, don't talk about mental health. They'll use that against us as a gun community or don't do this, don't do that. Kids to Kings directly addresses the two, and Katie reminded me even a third biggest negative statistics that gets thrown in the gun community's face. You get mental health and suicide with the emotional intelligence piece. You get the Surgeon General that I think, I forget if the exact percentage, but I believe 45, 46% of the childhood firearm violence ec- epidemic was young young black kids, um, violence between uh, them. And then you have negligent um, firearm discharges and accidents. This this program directly addresses all of them that can reduce that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, God, it's just, it's such a no brainer. And I don't want to, you know, I do want to give credit to, because I'm going to say it because I, I like to say things and I really don't, I'm not at this point in my life where I don't really have to hold my tongue, but I was really proud of Arms Corps and, um, and Davidson's and Ruger because when I went to ask them for help for this, I told them exactly what I wanted to use it for. And they were like, oh, yeah, any way we can help, right? And we need way more help than them. Like, it can't just be them. But I was proud because it's like the first time, like, I was just like, yeah, I just said it was literally for this, like, inner city youth program to to bring young shooters up, these young men that, you know, never get exposed to firearms in any way, but usually a negative way, right? A negative light. And they did it. And uh, there was something cool about that to me because I have, I agree with you, KD, like I've, I've thought in my head about it a lot, you know, uh, you know, people always say that we're racist and, 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 you know, I think they're right sometimes. So I think there's a lot of that old guard still hanging on to the firearms industry, but I think it's getting better. Um, it's got a long way to go, but, you know, like I said, these are my peers, you know, the owner of arms Corps, uh, Brian Tucker from Davidson's Chris Colloy from, from Ruger. And, uh, they didn't even bat an eye. They were just like, yeah, what do you need? You know, let's go. But I need more companies to do that. If it's not going to be a financial donation, send the products. You know what I mean? We need it. Mm-hmm. We need as much as we can put in their face. Right. Yeah, I, I would say, and even though it wasn't directly through Kids to Kings, the Greenwood project where the the the, the kids are, you know, running around uh, shooting and getting a lot of the toolage and education, uh, that project through Aiming for the Truth, which obviously is supporting Walk the Talk and Kids to Kings and working in conjunction with them, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to give my 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 heart, and I can't come up with enough words to thank the individuals at Brownells and the United States Concealed Carry Association, USCCA. Uh, those are two organizations that right off the bat, I mean, they made me put it on paper and I have no problem with that. Uh, but they looked at it. They were like, hey, you know what? If this is going to better Americans, if you're going to also be helping out these kids that nobody else can reach, if you are going to be making our children you know, better, well, more well-educated, Understanding the Second Amendment, they have a safe place to come do so. And every other program you want to run and families can come out and they can all participate. We're a thousand percent behind it. So if it wasn't for the USCCA and Brownells, Greenwood would not be standing now. Uh, And then thus, I wouldn't have a place for the Kids to Kings uh, program to operate without interference. So I want to make sure I give love to them, too, because you're right. As much as we. We have to still push back about the individuals or, or, or organizations or companies that aren't doing anything. I want to make sure we highlight and give good energy and love to individuals that are because they do deserve that credit. Arms Corps, uh, Davison's, Ruger, USCCA, Brownells. I know those organizations have stepped up, uh, made a difference. And, you know, every time I talk to them, you don't have to ask me to promote those products. Because everybody I encounter, but I'm not promoting them because, oh, I want some kind of commission from it. I'm doing it because these are these are companies that believe in these American values and believe in helping these Americans that are in, I mean, sometimes war zones that are wanting to make sure that they have a they have an opportunity to not only understand guns, but to become better human beings, better young men and women. Uh, So I would like to give a, a kind word out to them as well and to trust in me. And I think that other companies uh, should realize, like, this is if you want to make a change, make a change. And then imagine it for yourself. Right. If you're if you're thrown into a lawsuit, let's say. Right. And they're like, OK, 
you your gun is responsible for doing this and all you guys do is market violence to children through your advertisement, which I know was a real court case that happened. Imagine if your attorney is able to say, yeah, OK, well, if you're going to say that, why don't you talk about all the support that we sent out to these young people to be better educated, to uh, have better, better mental health? Right. While you're talking about we don't address the issues, we're absolutely addressing the issues. Uh, we're working with kids to reduce violence. We're doing all these things. Our products are being used and they are highlighting children using them in the proper way. The adults are using them in the proper way. They're talking about making sure that, hey, these aren't used to solve your problems. These are great sporting tools for you right now. And all these different things, all this social equity that you can get back to even use in a situation like that. So it really amazes me. Um, that, and look, uh, it's like counting another man's pockets. I mean, spend the money where you spend your money, but when you come and complain, but you bought a, a $150,000 booth, the shot show, but you can't come up with 15 grand to give out to your future customer, um, to help them in better their lives. I mean, man, I got to kind of, I got to kind of look at you a little bit different for gun rights organizations that are like, yeah, we want to, we want to fight, we want to fight, do this and that. And you're like, well, we're nonprofit, so we don't have any money to give back. But I see you throwing fifty thousand dollars, a hundred grand to sponsor, you know, a YouTube channel. Then I'm 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 you know, I gotta kinda look and question exactly what your motives are and just what kind of situation you really are in versus what you aren't. So if you and you can't force, I don't want to force anybody to do the right thing, right? You should just want to do it. But we have to be able to call out the hypocrisy when we see it. So if you want to change America, you have to change America from within. If you want people to stop throwing gun laws on the table, we have to start giving them less stats to utilize. Right. And let's create intelligent and informed advocates at the same time, because these are going to be the individuals that in a few short years are going to be speaking up. Right. So I think that the gun industry needs to own that. You can hide behind it all you want to. Um, you can say, oh, we don't have the disposable income. But once again, uh, when I see that you're you're floating money here and you're floating money there and you're spending $250,000 on a range day, just say that you don't want to do it. Just say that. I'll respect that better. Right. And I'm not telling anybody how to run their marketing campaigns, how to invest their finance. It's your money. You worked hard for it. I get that. But when you're complaining about, yeah, we want to stop these kind of movements in America, but you want you won't assist and fuel. You even said you don't have to send money. If all you have is product that we don't have to go spend money on. Great. You know, provide the awesome. Cool. And then you say, well, we don't have the product. Don't you don't? Because I, I promise you that there are 20 YouTubers that have your product right now. But you can send two of them for the kids. Just right. say you don't want to help. Be honest. Kevin, you got something for us. So I was repl replying in the chat, uh, Katie, I think Mike and I, we, we get in these meetings and there's maybe a lot of excitement about something that would be like groundbreaking. I don't want to put the specific one on blast, but maybe it gets down the line. We've worked countless weeks and legal shuts it down at the last moment. What would you say to some organization that's interested in K Kids to Kings, agrees with everything that you're kind of saying, but they don't want to be the leaders to take the risk and are hoping other organizations step forward to be the first ones to donate. And they'll, they'll, they'll maybe catch on later. Why should, why is that the wrong line of thinking? In a very loving way. And I say that I do. I seriously, I'm not being sarcastic when I say this in a very loving way, uh, in a very understanding way of the situation they might find themselves in. That's not how we cause change by being cowards. We, you have to be willing to step out and take a risk. And if somebody is going to speak neg negative of your company or organization because you want to help kids, I mean, imagine that just blind test. We are against Acme guns. We're against Acme guns because Acme guns show support to make sure kids stay out of prison and understand more about guns and gun rights and help them out with their mental health and make sure that they're experiencing any problems at home. They have a resource outside of the home to go get assistance. Now imagine that just blind tested. And who would look like the idiot? You or them, right? So we have to be willing to be brave to go out and create change. We can't worry about the naysayers, because if we did that, and I would I would probably honestly say a lot of companies and organizations, if they listened to the naysayers, would have never developed their own product in the first place. Because somebody said that's stupid. 
Somebody said, you don't need that. Somebody said, we already have that. Somebody else has already given you a reason not to succeed. And clearly you have. So no different than this, you know, and there's a thing called social corporate responsibility, you know, SCR. And when you start looking at corporate social responsibility, I think a lot of people historically from a business standpoint, really from foundations, have used that as a blackmail tactic to organizations. We're not trying to put you in that kind of situation. We're just saying when it looks when you look at your 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 corporate social responsibility, it's just about doing the right thing by your fellow Americans. And if somebody can't respect the fact that you want to help Americans, then I will ask you why you're listening or valuing their opinion anyway. That would be where I start. We want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Chattanooga Shooting Supplies, Inc. CSSI was founded in 1977 by two families that had a passion for hunting and the outdoors. That same passion holds true today for the second generation of family members and their 200 plus employees. Own a gun store or range? If so, you understand the importance of two-step distribution to help you meet the demand of your customers. Their mission is to exceed their customers' expectations with a strong service focus from a knowledgeable sales staff, an assortment of trusted and well-known brands, competitive pricing, and timely shipping. With over 50,000 SKUs of shooting and hunting-related products, they are in the business to help customers succeed. Learn more at ChattanoogaShooting.com. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I... I believe in corporate social responsibility. <laughs> I just do. I, I think that, you know, we got to help each other. I don't think, you know, anything should be mandated, obviously. But to me, this is just a no brainer. I mean, I've been saying this from day one about, you know, Walk to Talk America's programs is this is the perfect thing to use if you do get dragged into a court case or you are, even if you're just a Second Amendment advocate, if you're going to go into a room where people are going to challenge you, where their expectation level of you is next to nothing, right? And they think they're going to have these gotcha moments where it's like, well, all you gun people do is want to arm everybody and you don't actually do anything. And I'm like, well, Walk Talk America is created just to smash all that because clearly I, I, don't, I don't take L's when I walk into rooms. Uh, it's never happened. And I'm talking about when I walk into, I've taken some L's when I walked in my own rooms, uh, our, our people's rooms, but, um, <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, the anti-gun side or the gun neutral side. It just, it, it just makes sense. And I feel like, you know, I always use the analogy of the, uh, the alcohol industry getting ahead of DUIs. And I think that's how we do it, right? We do it because we want to make earth better. We don't do it just because we, we should do it's the right thing but we also just we want to make this better we want people to understand us and i think this is the way to do it is just lean into the negative outcomes and then provide solutions and then what what's the next step you're going to expose somebody for who they really are if they're just anti gun to the bone they're not going to meet you where you're at but you got to get to you got to get to that spot before they do you got to be better than them um, right. the other side are they're wheeling out children you know, in front of Congress, they're doing all these things to tug on heartstrings. And not that I think we need to wheel out our, our own children, but we can prove that we're, we're bettering these kids. And on that note, I kind of want to ask you a question. I don't want to put any of these kids business out there. You know, you've kind of touched on some of the things they've gone through, but do you have any like special story about like maybe one kid that you just saw, like kind of blossomed, like in the program? Uh, oh, know. yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to say my favorite because I want to make the other kids mad. Uh, but one of the young men in particular uh, shared a story early on about how he saw a gun firsthand be used inappropriately by, by an adult against another adult. Right. And he talked about the exchange, like what led up to it and things like that. And he, he couldn't wrap his mind around it. But to see someone be hurt like that, it it put a. Uh, a negative effect on him because a he saw how the gun was used, but b he thought that that interaction, their attitudes, were how he acted. He was like, the only difference is I didn't have a gun, right? So he's like, am I going to act like that if I have a gun? Because I yell the same. I, I, I you know, he was like, I don't. Ra what he basically said is, I don't understand how to rationalize. You know, if I see a problem, I argue just like they did, and we fight just like they did. The difference is they had a gun and I don't. 
So automatically I saw an opportunity there clearly, right. To fill in a lot of gaps. And first he was even hesitant to pick up a gun, very hesitant. And not because he was scared of what the gun might do, but you can see him having this challenge with my humanity has told me that thing. If I add that to who I am, if some bad is going to happen, right. Uh, because I haven't learned how to control my emotions. I don't know about de-escalation skills. I don't know about, you know, breathing techniques. I don't know any of those things, right? I haven't even really truly understood the value of people, right? And I don't trust myself, which is what I think a lot of people that have struggles with guns are really dealing with. They're dealing with the fact they don't trust themselves, right? Uh, Because if that was me in that situation, I would have, and they continue on with the story. Uh, But after a couple of conversations, and I use myself for an example, I said, hey, um, you know, I shared my story about coming up where I came up at, you know, worst city in America in the crack era and uh, seeing things firsthand. Like I didn't live it on TV. I I was I lived in the environment they made the movies off of. Right. So uh, being able to share that story with him and then saying, do I look like someone that wants to hurt people? He actually said yes. But that's just because of my mean look. But he's like, you know, I thought I talked a little more. He's like, well, no, I guess you don't. I said, now, am I carrying a gun? He's like, yeah. I said, man, I carry a gun every day, every single day. I said, now, the difference is I had to learn about self before I added the gun. I had to really do a deep dive into myself, even sharing with him the fact that I wanted to commit suicide the first time I picked up a gun, which is true. I tried to commit suicide twice as a teenager with a firearm. Um, it, it, and going through all these different stories of violence and things that I've seen, and I'm like, now I want you to understand that you get an opportunity to break that within yourself. Here is an opportunity for you. So what I don't want you to do, I don't want you to shoot a gun today. I don't want you to handle a gun. I want you to watch everyone else do it. And I want you to see if you trust them more than you trust yourself. I want you to think about if we can get you to emotionally control yourself. If you think that, you know, you are more violent than your peers, more violent than the adults that you see shooting. So I want you to sit down and think about that. And he was a little mad at first because he's like, no, I don't get to have fun because I was being honest. Like, no, it's not that it's not a punishment. I want you to observe because I want you to know that your value is equal to everyone else's and you can achieve the level of intelligence, emotional intelligence and self-care that they have. Right. Um, And he did. And so now fast forward. It's been I've been seeing this kid for over a year now. Fast forward. He's one of the first ones out the car. He's everything about gun. I mean, he is like, when do we get to do stuff like draw from the holster? When do we get to do all this other stuff that we're guiding him to do? And so I asked him a month ago. I said, hey, you remember the conversation we had about you not trusting yourself? He was like, yeah. I said, how do you feel now? And his response to me almost brought tears to my eyes. He says, I don't need a gun or anything to fix my problem. The only thing that can fix my problem is me. And so now that I know that I have full control over who I am, what I do when I grow up, my attitude, because I also told him a whole talk about people can't make you upset. You're not allowing yourself to get upset based off their actions. Right. Had that whole conversation. He understood that it was more about him than it was anybody else. And then he said to me, and I just like shooting guns and I don't have to make I, I am I am confident enough now that I won't use that thing to solve a problem because it can end a life, which is taking them away from their family, which is then taking me and putting me in a position that I'm someone who's destroying families and I wouldn't want somebody to destroy my family. So yeah, guns are just fun. I just want to have fun and I'm not that person anymore. That was out of the mouth of a 12 year old. Right. So yeah, that is, yeah, that's that, that to me in that moment, I, I had to walk away from it. Like, all right, go get in line. And I had to go take a minute. Right. Because that's just that's what it's about. Right. And now you see this kid out there just blasting, having a good time. Like when they pick up when he picks up a gun, now that particular kid, when he picks up a gun and if he's on the line with another kid, it automatically is a I can shoot better than you. Let's go. Right. Like it's a competition to him where at first it was like, I don't even trust myself to do it. Now he's seeing it as a sport. Let's compete. Let's see who's better. Right. So. And to add in the fact that he he gained tremendous emotional awareness and emotional intelligence. And that's just one. And I got plenty of more stories I could share. Yeah, no, that's great. That's exactly. I love hearing that. And that's. You're not the only person he's going to say that to. And that's the most important thing. Right. It's not just for you. He's going to say that to his peers and the other kids that are listening. And I think that's what it's all about. It's like the force multiplier thing. So. Yeah, it's just 
thank you for sharing that. I think it's just awesome. Like, like I said, I'm not, I'm looking to get there in November for the next one. Um, you know, I, I got to hear the stories to you guys, but it's just something I'm always going to support. And, uh, you know, me, like I'm not, you know, it, I know it's in good hands with you and Devin and the gorillas and the miss guys and everybody that's Jelani and everybody that is, is there. I know you guys actually care about these kids well being. Um, and we're not getting any like hero awards for this stuff that we've done, but hopefully one day we'll be able to look back on all this and be like, yeah, damn. I remember when it started and it was this, and we were picking up people and, you know, <laughs> scrounging mm -hmm. up gas money and all this stuff and looking to where we could get these kids fed for the day and, you know, worrying about their shoes and things like that. And this is leading into to what we're going to say, like every penny donated for kids to Kings goes into kids to Kings. It, this isn't even one of those things where, you know, when you donate to Walk the Talk America, maybe spread out over a few programs that we have, right? We got multiple programs. We got multiple people doing things. When someone donates and says, this is for Kids the Kings, Devin, everybody's notified that it came in and that's what's in, you know, it's in, it gets added to the budget, 100% of it for whatever it is we need to do for these kids. So I just want people to understand that, to be very clear that this is one of those things because everyone always says, be careful who you donate to. You got to find out how, what percentage of the dollar is actually going to the actual program. When it mm -hmm. comes in and you say kids, the Kings, a hundred percent goes to kids, the Kings doesn't go to anything else. Cause guys like Kevin Dixie are out there doing this for free. <laughs> so it is going to whatever they need to make this happen. Um, I, I need people to understand that. Right. KD, and speaking of the heroes, um, I think I, I want people to understand the opportunity that's in front of these kids. I wish this would have happened to me when I was a kid. Uh, just one of the last things they got to experience, I'll keep it short, is that, you know, uh, out at the Greenwood Project, we were actually helping out a veteran organization that day uh, do some pretty uh, cool things. And a part of that uh, organization I got to get to come over and speak to the kids were the stunt devils from the Avengers movies. So they got to meet the guy that actually played Captain America stunt devil, the, the young lady that got to be a uh, black widow stunt devil. And they were in certain other movies and they started talking about it and they met and worked with all these people. And you should have seen the kids eyes like, Whoa, you were Captain America. Like, and they got to go over and say, yeah. So in the movie, when that happened, that was me. And now all of a sudden these kids are like, Oh crap. And one kid out of his mouth said, I thought I was just coming to shoot. I met Captain America today. Right. Like it's it's a lot of cool opportunities that these kids are getting um, that are astonishing. And the more and more that we can have support for them and the more and more we can get them out, the more and more we can even introduce them to cool, really cool uh, things like that, which I thought was awesome. I mean, I don't know who's more excited, the kids or me. Right. Like to sit there and listen to these guys and, and ladies and and talk about the different things they've done in Hollywood and how the scenes are filmed and how they got into that career field in case the kids were interested and things like that. I think that's really cool. So just when you think it's gun, 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 I mean, you'll be surprised the kind of stuff that we can pull off as long as we have support for the kids, because I'll go above and beyond um, every every way that I can to make sure that they're having all these great experiences, because those kids are never going to forget the day that they met the guy to play Captain America. Right. The guy that was doing the flips over the cars and grabbing a shield and throwing, they're never going to forget that. Katie, what was the timeline between that, that those two conversations where that one kid didn't feel like he was ready or trusted himself to then him having that growth in emotional intelligence? Uh, right around a school season. So I would say right around a school year. Right around a school year. Might be a little bit short. It wasn't quite as long as a school year, but definitely somewhere between the, the six to eight month mark. Yeah. Speaking of like timelines and consistency, we're pretty much doing one event a month at this point. Um, you know, how, how do you, what would you like to see? I mean, if you, if we had just an endless budget, like we could just throw something to that, like in your idea, cause one of the things I want to do, and I've been pushing Devin for this and he, he wrote a curriculum, but I want to take it to other cities as well. I mean, we've, we've, mm -hmm focused all of our energy in Atlanta, but it's made sense, right? Because we're like a group that's like honing our skills, right? Like right. let's do it there. You're providing the facility and we have you there and we have the rest of the team there. Devin's in Colorado, but 
Um, and I guess in the ideal world that w- where you could ask anything, would you like to see this as like a weekend program or once at least once a month, right? Among Walk the Talk America's partners, Arms Corps may have the most colorful history of them all. But then again, that likely happens when you have a company that's lasted for more than a century. Started in 1905 in the Philippines and expanding operations to right here to Nevada in 1985, Arms Corps offers some of the finest firearms you'll find on the market. From shotguns to 1911s, and from ammunition to a competitive shooting team, Arms Corps offers a lot. But there's something more. Arms Corps is the first manufacturer to print the free and anonymous mental health screenings link offered through Walk the Talk America's website right there on their packaging. If you buy an Arms Corps product, you will not only see our flyer inside, but you may actually see the screenings link printed on the side of the box. Go to armscor.com, that's armscor.com, to find out more about their heritage, their products, and their competitive shooting team. We're proud and thankful to have Arms Corps as a partner. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't, uh, realistically, especially with the kind of support system that's being built here, like Devin going out and getting gorillas in the midst to be counselors and the couple other counselors he has. Um, and I don't see why it shouldn't be something that can happen at minimum every other week, every other weekend at minimum, uh, and at obviously at maximum every weekend because there are so many different things we can also do with the kids. Like I said, I'm a big fan of all things gun. Uh, but one of the things that I was looking at well, last week, I went to a local uh, shop to pick up a part that I needed for my rifle. And I noticed that they have uh, for 10 bucks, they they run a water, a water filtration class. I'm like, well, that'd be cool. Kids get to come in and learn how to filter dirty water. That'd be cool. It's 10 bucks. Right. That kind of stuff would be cool. So there's so many different things we can do to get them out their environments uh, and still get them around things that are two way centric. Right. Like medical. You know, uh, being able to live off the land and stuff like that to keep that going. But I would like to see them out every weekend. Uh, there's no reason it shouldn't be. And if we can get people to really support uh, the project, even if they come through Walk to Talk, if we can get a building put on Greenwood, then I would love to be able to see us do a two week camp where the kids are with us for two weeks straight. Right. During the summertime. And we have all these programs and beautiful things that are centric to the children uh, to where we can actually extract them from their environments for a significant amount of time and really, really work with their minds, right? And and at the same time, it seems silly, but every parent can use a break, right? So if they know their kids are safe, they get two weeks to kind of like hit the reset button themselves. You want to talk about mental health? Somebody please take the kids, right? <laughs> Before I can get myself together, right? But I would love to be able to see them come out for a, a couple of weeks at a time. But so that's how I feel about that. Um, every other weekend at minimum, every week if we can do it. And with the counselors that we have in place, uh, you know, the unfortunate part of what I do is I have to travel the country. Well, not have to. I love traveling the country, teaching people how to operate the guns and doing the civil rights speeches and stuff that I do. However, the counselors that have been put in place that are showing up, that are putting effort into these kids, I'm fine with them being at the facility. Uh, we have multiple bays now, so there's no reason why the kids can't always be doing something. We have the staff. We have a large enough facility to where the kids aren't interfering with anything. I would love to see them all the time. We just need more support. Yeah, no, it makes sense. All right, we had uh, we had a guest on what was it, a week and a half ago, Kevin Terry from Chicago, um, and and it was crazy because you know Terry grew up in it, like he grew up in those four blocks there where the majority of violence happens in Chicago, but he just took another path for himself. But when I was talking to him about Kids of Kings, he lit up. He's like, "Man, we need that here," you know, and uh, he's a high pro profile YouTuber, TikToker, and um, said he was like, yeah, if you come up here, any way I can help promote that type of program in the neighborhood, I think that'd be excellent. So I really, really, really hope that we can get the funding to take this on the road because I think Houston needs it. I am. Well, the other side funds Moms Demand in every town. Why can't we fund Walk the Talking Kids to Kings? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because it absolutely should be across the country. There's no reason why. The only thing that is literally stopping it is the support because I think I'm speaking for everybody that's involved. We give what we're given 10 times more if we can just get the support to make it happen. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we're up again. This is supposed to be a quick pop-up, <laughs> but I had this funny feeling that if you got me and you in a room together, we were just going to keep talking. <laughs> so it's always a time and time. 
it, it's always a pleasure to have you on and, and listen to you talk. I think, um, I think you're a walking soundbite, man. Like I, I, uh, <laughs> I absolutely love just letting you go. You're a great guest to have on. You have a lot to say. And, uh, and I think a lot of people can learn from your words. So I appreciate you, sir, coming on to talk about this program. And I want everyone to understand how much this program means to us, but should mean to the country. It should mean to the industry. It should mean to everybody. It is truly something beautiful and it's in its infancy stages and, and we got to get support for it to have it grow. But it's the right thing to do. And honestly, it's one of the few, everybody I talk to, especially in mental health, they always say, oh yeah, well, there's a program like that in Denver. And then I start asking them about it and I'm like, no, it's not the same. That's not the same. Cause everybody has these de-escalation programs where they go in and they talk to youth, but there's nothing that actually does everything that you're doing with these kids, man. And, the, and every one of them lacks the firearms element. And let's face it, that's, if we want to reduce the number of negative outcomes by firearms, this is how you do it. You don't keep, you don't, you address it and you teach them. So, you know, like I said, I want to give you your flowers for everything you do for us, the industry, everybody, um, you know, anytime you want to come on here and talk about anything, there's always an open door. Um, and thank you. No, man, thank you. I appreciate the kind words as always. And I'm only in the company of uh, people that are, are my, my moral equal. So, and words go right back to you and every uh, uh, Kevin, yourself included, everybody that's giving back to kids, to Kings and, and trying to make a difference in, in lives of good people. I think if we um, if we tap into the good moral compass of more people and are willing to accept it, I think that we can absolutely make a great change in the country. So I'm small. I'm proud just to be a small pebble in the in the mountain, man, whatever I can do. Yeah, no. I, and and I want, Kevin, I want to Mr. Barry, I want to give you your credit. He is responsible for the logo. Ke oh. And you. And you did that way before your total involvement in Walk the Talk America. And yeah, I that was that was one of our first projects after the website. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of cool. Um, I remember when you made that logo, and I sent it over to Devin, and Devin fell in love with it, and I was so happy because <laughs> it's like you hit it on the first shot. You know what I mean? <laughs> Colors and everything. So. A little bit of uh, Kids the King's history, I think, that we got to throw out there that a lot of people probably would have never expected or known. But, yeah, you know, that that logo is – that badass logo is there because of you, sir. <laughs> so Nice. All right, everybody. We want to thank you for tuning in. We want to thank our sponsors. You know, obviously, it's the usual – the usuals, the Davidsons, the Lipsies. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to even extend that to some of the people that have supported us in other ways. It's like the high points, the Chris Changs, the Bursas, all the people that step up. Uh, like I said, not everything has to be a financial donation. So sometimes it's just about the support. Um, but most, first and foremost, thank you to Ruger. Uh, you know, thank you to everybody that supports us. Thank you to every listener that shares this. Thank you for everybody that shows up in the chat. We really appreciate it. And we will see you soon. We will see you in about 24 hours, right, Kevin? We're back at it again in 24 hours. <laughs> Less than 24 <laughs> hours. I'm going to try to make that one. I got an appointment, so you might be running that one. If uh, there's tech technical glitches, Yikes. play Mike. Yikes. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Till next time. Guns and Mental Health is a FreshCast Media production. For more information, visit freshcastmedia.com.